Hello, hello, hello. Welcome once again. It's very good to see you always, always, always. You know what to do. Let everyone know we are on and let's just lift our voices in prayer and praise to God as we thank him for another opportunity to hear his word that brings life and light and power and peace and healing and prosperity and every good thing. And let's ask him to open our eyes to see wondrous things, to see what we've not seen before uh, in his word. Go ahead and just lift your voice where you are. Give thanks. Welcome God into the space where you are. He's already there, but recognize his presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in every place where your children are gathered. Thank you for another opportunity to hear your word and to be changed by it and transformed. Thank you, Lord, that today you're giving us a word in season that is going to progress us, that's going to bring healing, that's going to expose the lies of the devil, that's going to help us win, Lord, that we are not taken advantage of. May this word nourish our hearts and souls and may it bring life, life, life to everyone who hears it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Yeah, I know, I know, I know the series has been hot. We've now even called it a series. I don't know, the word has been a bit hot the past two weeks and I thought I was done, but I was convinced by some of you to touch on at least two more things. The truth is that the traps that the enemy sets are very, very many, so we can't, we can't spend years talking about them. Um, but we've been doing a series basically, Dangerous Traps to Avoid. Things that the enemy puts in your way that look innocent and cute and um, yet they are set out to actually derail you, sometimes destroy you, sometimes just slow you down and make you lose time. And in finding out what those things are and what the solutions are, we are able to redeem time. Um, we are able to turn around and, and also get out of any path of destruction that we've been taking. And God is having mercy on us. So a couple of things that I've already shared. <clears throat> the first one we shared was about the trap of disconnecting from people God has used in your life. And we said that that one, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. We also talked about ignoring patterns. We, talked about, uh, we also talked about ignoring spiritual things. We talked about becoming an unfruitful Christian. All those are traps. They look very innocent and most believers actually fall in them. Because in the beginning, the thing with the trap is it doesn't look like it's dangerous. That's how you fall in it. The point of deception is that you're deceived. Otherwise, you would, you would, if you saw that it was dangerous, you find a hole on the road, you go the other way. But if it looks like it's covered, you step right on thinking there is covering only to fall into a deep ditch. So that's what the enemy has been trying to do in many of our lives, set traps and make us turn into very unspiritual people. We've become carnal believers, which I don't even know. It's an oxymoron. The two can't work. And God is calling us as a generation of, of Christians and believers to really rise up. It's time for us, for the church of Jesus Christ, to become a church full of fruitful believers, to become a church full of radical people who are making disciples, who are doing evangelism. But it's going to be difficult to witness to people who you look exactly like. like they're like, what's the difference between you and I? Why should I listen to what you're telling me? So our witness begins with the victories in our own lives. And so God is calling us to be radical that we may be effective witnesses and effective disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may bear fruit. So today I want to talk about two more. <laughs> and the ones of today are sensitive. <laughs> they are sensitive people, they are sensitive. So I want you to put on your sensitive gear and be able to, to get through this one, yeah? So first of all, why are we talking about this? Again, I'll show you 2 Corinthians 2, 11 that says, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, if you're ignorant of his devices, he will take advantage of you. And for some of us, he had already started taking advantage of us, you know, cutting us off from people who have helped us in life through offense, being hurt, uh, misunderstandings, just immaturity, etc., etc. Others, it's been that you've become an unfruitful Christian. You're very comfortable just sitting in the pews, attending when you can, giving your tithe and going back home. And yet God wants to produce 
life out of you and for others it's been just being a very unspiritual spiritual person you, you're called spiritual but you're very unspiritual you don't pray you don't read your bible you don't enjoy fellowship at all and um, you don't value spiritual things but that's changing and for others it was patterns patterns in our lives patterns in our families that we have either ignored or we've been participating in creating and so we've arrested all those things because the word of god brings light that's what it brings light when light comes you can see it exposes what's there it doesn't create it simply manifests you suddenly see oh i didn't know there was a book there i didn't know there was a nail there you know so light comes and shows you what you should avoid so today um i'm going to be talking about a trap that <laughs> two traps that are sensitive traps because many of us are in them so there's something that is very interesting especially in our generation and it's the trap of it's falling into the trap of not training up our children in the way of God. Because there's a way. Not training up our children in the way of the Lord. It's a trap. And so, let me read for you a scripture. I'm going to read for you a scripture that's instructive. I'm going to ask you to stay with me, stick with me. I'm going to be addressing and attacking some things you've probably embraced as a way of parenting that is modern. But if you'll allow, if we can look through the scriptures and see, then we can walk together so that we raise a generation of children who can be radical for Christ as well and can actually uh, impact their generation and can also succeed in life because some of them, the things we are doing are going to make them really struggle in life. And when they look back, they won't be very happy with you, uh, even though right now you might seem like the favorite parent. So get ready for some uh, ambushes on some of some things. I'm serious. I'm preparing you ahead of time. It's a little bit sensitive. So there's a scripture in Proverbs 22, verse 6, and then verse 15. Proverbs 22, 6, Proverbs 22, 15. Same chapter, two different verses. Okay? This is King Solomon, the wisest man, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Meaning, as a parent, you have a serious responsibility. And that responsibility is the responsibility of helping a child find their way that they should go. Now, this is not referring to their career. It's not referring to their marriage partner. It's referring to principles that govern life, a way in which they should live. If you want your child to grow up not to become corrupt, uh, not to become abusive, not to become dishonorable, not to become difficult to love, not to become difficult to get a job, not to become a person who lacks favor, lacks progress, lacks maturity, you know, the way they should go, there is a way. There is a way. And there's a way our children should go. And it's up to the parent, not the teachers, the teachers are not the ones who train their children in the way they should go. It's the parent who trains the children in the way they should go. And if we do our job, whichever way we do it, whether well or badly, what happens is that when they grow up, they will not depart from the way that we train them to go. If we train them to be competitive and, and, and unable to control their emotions and disrespectful, they will stick to that way. When they grow up, they will not depart from it. <laughs> They will need the help of the Holy Spirit and a lot of counseling and preachers, which some of us have had to go through. Some of you have had to go through as people who are disciples, that you meet people in their old age and you're shocked that they're behaving like seven-year-olds and you have to correct a 30-year-old's behavior that they're behaving like they're seven and you're dealing with them for 10 years, teaching them to share, teaching them to respect people. Why? Their mother wanted to be their friend. I shouldn't even start yet. I need to first lay the foundation. But I'm, I'm burning, I'm burning. Because I've seen things with the way we are raising our children and I'm like, my God, we are in trouble. We are in real trouble because uh, we are raising our children according to the pattern of the world, according to what we've seen in the Western world on television. Children who abuse parents, who have outbursts, who, who can't control themselves, who, who are entitled, who are raised by television. I mean, we are raising a dangerous generation. You know, they are impatient, they, they don't understand process, they, we, we are, and we are the ones teaching them the way they should go. We think someone out there will correct it. It's the work of the parent, the mother and the father to train up a child in the way they should go. Now, what does the word train mean? I'm going to show you an example, first of all, in the scriptures 
of how not to raise your children and how God um, deals with us as parents and the children who we choose to raise some way. The word train, listen, when they say train up a child, to train is to teach a person or an animal a particular skill or type of behavior through practice and instruction over a period of time. I'll read it again. When they say train up a child, what they're saying is do this for the child. Teach your child particular skills and behaviors through practice and instruction over a period of time. Do you understand that there is a period of time within which you are going to train your child? It's going to be very difficult to teach our children at 40 or 30. I don't even know if you can call them children anymore. That they are just sons and daughters at that point. If you're not, like there's a window within which you train a child and when that window passes, it's more difficult. And then beyond a certain window, it's not possible. You have to trust God to send another person to undo the years of something that was done. To train is being intentional. It's about skills. It's about behavior. And you do it through consistent practice. Like when you're teaching your child to make a bed. Oh my God, ask me. Maybe I don't know how to parent, but it takes time. And you have to show them what a good bed looks like and then teach them and then discipline them around it until one day, praise God, they're able to make a bed well and without your involvement. It takes time, intentionality, and practice to teach skill and behavior that is training up a child over a period of time. The other translation, the other way that it says it's to point or aim something, that, that's not really it, to train. I, I'm talking about teaching teaching skill or type of behavior basically when i look at my children the type of behavior they're exuding some of which i really don't like is what i have trained them to have mm -hmm. yeah and when they grow up they won't depart from it if i don't undo it within a certain period of time that's why you find people who still still struggle with social skills they are 40 and they struggle with social skills because when they were young no one taught them to relate with others and they, they are, they've gone through school they have an education they work but even where they work, they can't relate with people because they were not taught when they were younger. Dear parent, you and I have a great responsibility. Parenting, the lie and the trap that parenting is for the school teachers and for the, for the some people say, let's take our children to church and they will learn discipline. Not really, it will be strengthened there, but you teach it at home. The person who coined the phrase charity begins at home was right. Train up a child. Now let me show you a man of God who did not train up his children in the way they should go. Oh well, he trained them in a certain way, but I don't think it was the way they should have gone. You see, in the Old Testament, when priests, you were born into a priesthood lineage, like that's what you were born into. So if you are a priest, it was like hereditary, you would hand over the priesthood to your children because it was just priests beget priests. Now, Eli, now that's what some of you think actually. You think, ah, I grew up in a wealthy home, no matter how I raise my kids, they will will be always be wealthy. No, there are principles that made your parents wealthy. And if you don't follow them and you don't teach your children to follow them, they'll become broke like the rest of the world, most of the world. It's about principles. They govern life. Like principles don't respect who you are, where you're born, which nation you live in, how tall you are, how beautiful or wonderful you are and how good your heart is. Principles are principles. If you try to go against gravity, it doesn't matter how nice you are, it will bring you down. A principle is a principle. So just thinking that it will always be this way is not true. Whatever it is that you have, there's, a, there's something that led you to get it. There are principles that led you there. And in ignoring them, you, ca you cut yourself off from that process and therefore start to get a new result. Remember we said everything is a harvest, meaning there are seeds that must be planted. So there's this man called Eli, the priest of God, who raised a wonderful prophet called Samuel. But he had sons. Now, um... I, I, I think there were two sons, or three. Let me say, I think there were two. So let's read First Samuel chapter 2 from verse 22. I'll read 22 to 25. Then I'll skip and go to 29. No, we'll go to 27. All right. First Samuel 2 from verse 22 up to verse 31. 22 to 31. Now Eli was very old and he had everything his sons did to all Israel. How they lay with women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Basically they were sleeping with prostitutes at the, at, the, at the temple. So he said to them, 
why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil doings from all the people. Like, is this the reaction that a priest should have about his sons sleeping with, with, with prostitutes at the temple? Oh, what are these things I'm hearing? They are not nice. No, my sons, for it's not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father. Because the Bible says the Lord desired to kill them. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up upon my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Like basically, am I not the one who gave you these children? Am I not the one who gave you this office that you have? Am I not the one who gave you the money that has made you go mad and start raising your kids like crazy children? Am I not the one who has blessed you? God is like, why have you forgotten me? Why are you raising your children against me? And he says, why did you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons more than me? to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord says of Israel, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. That's what God had promised Eli. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me, I, I shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Far from us, far from us, far from us. Why did I read this story? To show you the severity of how we raise our children. Because these guys, Eli had an office from God. God had blessed him. He was a priest of God. He raised a great prophet called Samuel. But in his same house, he raised his sons to become children he did not discipline. He had no strong hand as a father, as you could see. His children were sleeping with temple prostitutes. They were eating part of the sacrifice, and people knew it. It was open knowledge. You would think he would chastise them greatly. He would pronounce like a curse on them, like he is a man who honors God. He would rebuke them sharply. No, but he was very gentle. He's like, why do you guys do this? It's not, ni it's not nice. <laughs> and you know the end of it? Eli ends up dying. His children die on the same day. The priesthood is taken away from them. God removes his covenant with them and puts it on another lineage. You know, you can be in a place where you're so blessed right now and the very thing that God gave you as a, as, a, as a blessing becomes a curse because now you think because there's money, you have money, you want to raise you, you feel like values and principles are for people who are broke. And you think that when you're wealthy, it means that you raise your children like uh, little wild animals. It has to stop. What am I talking about? When the Bible says train up a child, teach a child skills and behaviors over a period of time intentionally in a way that they should go so that you know that you're raising a person. For me, when I see my child throwing a tantrum now, and even if I, I, I don't feel nice disciplining them, the truth is that it's hard. You know, you love your children and you, and you don't want to inflict any discomfort or pain. But when I see them doing it, I think of it 20 years from now and think she'll be in an office throwing a tantrum before many people and they'll be wondering where was this one raised and she'll have no friends people will be talking about her and as I go through that scenario I will discipline you now so that one day later you will be pleasant to be around you'll be able to control your emotions under pressure you know these things of children banging doors whose door do you bang because to bang a door is trying to pass a message to someone that you're upset you must control your feelings you must because no one, you don't have to express everything you feel. The Bible says a fool vents all his feelings. A fool vents all his feelings. Can't raise our children to be fools who must say what they feel and do what they feel. And oh, What about the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Where will it work? Anyway, train up a child in the way you should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, Proverbs 22, 15 says this. For those of us who have the, 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 the doctrine of you're, you're reasoning with your three-year-old about maybe brushing their teeth. You're telling them the advantages and disadvantages and telling them, now you choose. Because if you don't, your teeth will rot. Huh? No, brush your teeth. You don't yet have the mental ability to make a decision about cause and effect. If you give a three-year-old the pros and cons of brushing teeth and then tell them, now make a choice, what choice do you think they're going to make? They're going to make a choice not to brush. Because they don't really understand the consequences of rotten teeth and cavities. Mm -hmm. I don't care. 
if you give a, a child a choice between sleeping and watching television and tell them if they don't sleep, they will doze at school tomorrow. Uh, what choice do you think a kid is going to make? Of course, the child is going to make a choice to watch TV because it's more pleasurable. Th that's your work. Your work is to say, no, you're not doing that. Yes, you're going, no, you won't do that. You only watch TV on the weekend and it's supervised and it's this amount of time. And whether you throw a tantrum or not, it's okay. One day you realize that I was helping preserve your brain cells. Parents. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22 verse 15, foolishness is bound up. You imagine something that is bound like it is wrapped and bound up in the heart of a child. Like there's a gift that is wrapped, bound, put in the heart of a child. It's called foolishness. And then it tells you that what will drive it away? The road of correction will drive it far from your child. Meaning when you deny your child correction, you are saying keep foolishness bound up in your heart. Just that now you'll be 30 years old and you'll be a fool. Let me show you scripture. I'm going to, this one, I have to first show you scripture, then we get into what are we talking about, what are some of the things that, that, that we should look out for. Proverbs 13, 24. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The Bible tells us to discipline our children promptly. Promptly means quickly. Like when your child does something, my children know, that there are things which even if they do when we're in a public place, I mean, I've had a time when I parked my car and uh, administered discipline to my child. Parked it on the road, got out, they couldn't believe it and dealt with the matter. They need to know that in matter. if we're at church, we, I will take you out and find a safe, quiet place and administer the medicine. Do it promptly because children won't even remember after one week that they did something. They'll be confused. Your discipline won't work. It has to work at the point that the child has done a thing. You can excuse yourself when their guests take them to the room, deal with the matter and come back. It takes five to ten minutes. There are things that we should not allow our children to do. Discipline them promptly. If you don't discipline your children promptly, the Bible says you hate them. Because you're not thinking about their future. You're not multiplying that matter times ten times 20 years. Proverbs 29, 15. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. We're not only talking about using chiboko, which is really a rod. Sometimes it's rebuking the child sharply about a matter. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Verse 17. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Don't be scared of correcting your children. When you do it, they'll bring you so much joy in the latter years. So much joy. I had to, they, they, I've, I've not done excellently concerning disciplining my children, but I've tried. I'm not perfect, but I try. And I've seen my daughter who's become a teenager and the peace that she's brought us already. Like, I'm not worried about her because we really over-disciplined in the earlier years. At some point, I actually felt like maybe I'm a bad person, like I'm a monster. I'm over-correcting because I would be around some people who are so casual about certain things. And me, I'm thinking about this thing 20 years from now, how the children, a child will be, and I'm going crazy with discipline. But the Bible tells me that a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And mothers, listen to me more than, you see that the dads are going to be on your case telling you you're too much, you over-discipline the children. Over, you know who they'll blame? The mother. They bring shame to the mother. When they are good, they praise the dad. When they are bad, they look at the mom. You discipline, the work of discipline is mostly left to the mother. The father instructs, rebukes, corrects. But the disciplinary role is the mother because you're more present with the children. You see things quickly. You, na you nip them in the butt immediately. When you catch it, get it out. It says, correct your son and he'll give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Let me, you, the thing with discipline is that it's not pleasant. Even when I'm administering it, like when I've had to spank my children, my God, I feel so bad. So bad. I don't want to do it. I, I have to go through like a thousand questions in my head. Must I really do this? Can is there another way? Because I don't want to do it. But there are things which are non-negotiables. Like a child crosses that line. No. No. So like for example, what are some of the things that I've seen? Outbursts. Emotional outbursts. Children and parents are there. You say, oh, nah, you know, he's having a bad day. And that child multiplied times 18 when he's having a bad day and screaming at the whole organization. 
and calling people names and using nasty words because you massaged that devil in that child until they kept growing. As they grew older and got more power, they got worse. These are the kids who beat people up, who beat their wives, beat their husbands. They can't control. They think they must fight. They have to express their emotions. Outbursts of rage. You know, I've, I've also had crazy things like people who say um, they, they train their children to believe that you can't celebrate another person. So if it's the birthday of your child, you have three children. If it's, if it's Nana's birthday, you must give Joel a gift on Nana's birthday because Joel is going to cry. Joel and Sophia must also get a gift because they'll feel bad that Nana got a gift and they didn't get a gift. What are you teaching them? There are times when they will not be celebrated. It will be your opportunity to celebrate someone who has succeeded. But you'll be sulking and crying and feeling sad because you know I never taught to celebrate a person. I can't do that for my children. All children are going to go through that phase. And what you do is at that point you rebuke it. Say, I want you to sit there and smile and be happy for your sister. And if you can't, I want you to leave the room and go. We are happy here. When your birthday came, they were happy for you. It's your turn. You always have a child like that. And now my children, ah, uh, they don't care. Like when it's so and so's birthday, everyone is happy. They're opening the gifts of their friend. They are so happy. Come and see. Mommy, come and see what the other one got. But they went through the phase of I'm crying at so and so's birthday. And all of them got some discipline and rebuke. Not like I'll, I'll spank them. No, I'll do that maybe if you don't change for many years. But I didn't have to. I would talk to them about it and tell them to stop it, control your emotions. That's not of God. You should be able to celebrate another. You think it's cute. Your child, your, your child must get, if you're buying for, for children shoes, everyone must get shoes. What if the other one doesn't need shoes? Only one child needs shoes. I'm not going to be under some bondage and I am imprisoned by my children that I can't buy shoes for the one who needs them because the other rest will cry. What? What are you teaching? That, that if someone gets something, you must also get it. Those are the kids, those are the adults who grow up and if so-and-so buys a phone, they have to buy it. This one buys a car, they have to buy They don't even need it, but they are used to. If someone gets something, I'm watching them, I must also get it. Why? That's what I know. That's what my mother trained me to do. Because I, 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 there's never a time when my brother got anything different from me. No, I don't buy clothes for all the children, shoes for all the children, this for all the children. No, I'll buy, they even know, oh, you didn't buy this because I don't need it. Because we've had to talk about it. I, I bought this one clothes because they need clothes you don't. I bought this one shoes, they need shoes you don't. Because that's life. You don't always get what everyone gets. What are we teaching our children? What about the outfits our kids are wearing? I see children ah, in hot pants. Eh? With bum show. Little girls. Crop tops. That it's cute. It's cute. You're training them up in the way they should go. When they are older, oh, they will wear hot pants. Just that you won't like the sight. We are raising a generation of righteous children. Food, food habits, indulgence. You find children eating so much and they're eating bad things. The fuel in their body, they eat junk, 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 fast foods, soda, these all sorts of drinks. These are children, sugars, sausages, that's all they eat. They don't enjoy eating vegetables, they don't eat, they don't eat organic food, they don't eat fruit that you say, kids just don't like fruit. No, you never train them to like fruit. When they are older, they will have to learn to eat fruits. When their body has already had a certain fuel that is negative. I'm talking practical things. Excusing behavior, letting them talk to people very badly. See some kids who abuse people who work in homes here in Africa. And the parent is like, I don't know. I don't know why that child talks like that. You don't know what? That one for me, we don't even talk straight for medicine. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. You do not talk to people like that disrespectfully. If I hear it, you're finished. Because that's how you're going to treat people who are less privileged than you as you grow older. Those are the people who deal with people so poorly in their later years. What are we raising? Your child bangs doors. They, they are torn towards you. They, they answer you back rudely. I've had to get to kneel down, look at my child face to face and say, don't you ever talk to me like that. Ever. Ever. I'm your mother. We've trained the children to know when you come back home. I don't want you to listen to me and think we have perfect children. No. We are still teaching, training, disciplining. But I'm not no longer, I'm no longer a coward mother because I was a coward. I used to feel like I'm too much. But I, we are on the journey. The children still have a lot of work. But I'm not willing to be that parent, honestly. The one which the world celebrates where children answer you back, they abuse you. They, we can discuss and talk out. We are very free with our children, but you don't, there's a line you don't cross. When we come back home, you turn off the TV, welcome us. Otherwise, there'll be no TV for like a month. 
so now I have TV which I bought, that's my TV you're watching. Turn it off, come welcome me, ask me how my day was, take things from the car, carry things with me, sit with me, talk to me, ask if you can go back to watch. I may say no, I may say yes. <laughs> Train up a child in the way they should go. How they deal with authority. I've heard about parents who teachers say they can't report the kids because they turn against the teachers. The children even know, my mom will come and abuse you. What are you raising? Those are the kids who will end up in prison because they can't deal with police. They don't understand authority. They don't know when to keep quiet, when to say sorry, even when they've not done a thing. Like there are people who you don't answer back. You just don't. It's your grandma. It's your grandpa. If they're, if they're angry at that moment, you say sorry, then you can explain another time. Of course, I can't finish all the things, but you know what I'm saying. What I want you to ask yourself the next time you're permitting because you're trying to make your children your friends. You are not supposed to be your child's friend. You will become friends eventually. But what you should pursue is not friendship. It's parenting. The role of a parent is to train a child in the way they should go. Is to discipline them. Is to help them to be children who can grow up to succeed in life. So don't fall in the trap of becoming your child's BFF. And just indulging them. Buying them gadgets. Children have phones at three years. Five years. They are, they are on the internet at ten years. Do you know what's out there? Unless you live in a country where you must be in touch with your child and you should disable certain features. What is your child doing? You know, and then your children come and tell you things like, oh, everybody in my school uh, has a phone. Me, my children have told me those things. Mommy, so and so's mom bought her this. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Then they keep looking at me. I'm like, is there anything you want to tell me? Yeah. Mommy, do you think I can get Then I laugh. They also laugh. Because recently someone was telling my daughter that, uh huh. so now that you're 13, do you think... They are going to give you a phone. She laughed. It's like they are tickled her. Because she knows it's not possible. You're not, you're, not, you're not ready to manage a phone yet. Eventually she's going to get it, but not at 13. But is she mature enough to handle it? Does she know what it means? Is she mature enough to handle a phone? I don't know. So it's not about everyone is doing it. It's the cool thing to do. Oh, I don't know. These ones are watching movies which are above their age. I don't know. This and the other. TV time. No. And I've, I actually realize that it's not about where you live in the world. It's just values. I visited people who live in, in, in the countries where you think children are permissive and parents. Not at all. I've seen families in the Western world that raise their children the way of the Bible. You see, the word of God works. Whether you live in Kazakhstan, USA, Nigeria, Uganda, Morocco, the Bible is the Bible. It doesn't adjust to where you live, depending on the temperatures and if you have snow or not. So stop it. Stop trying to copy television. But you think it's so cool for kids to go around abusing parents and, and dressing skimpy and what are, you, what are you raising? We're supposed to raise a righteous generation. Because there are things which, when you train your child now, when they grow older, they, there are things I still can't do. Because I was raised that way, like, I can't. They're even, they even not like big things, but I can't do them. Because I, it's like, it's wrong. Why? I, it's wrong. I was told it's wrong. I, was, I know it's wrong from the time I was a child. And I've seen even the people who I was raised with, whether they are Christians or not, their values they still esteem. Because that's how we were raised. Don't fall into that trap of raising your children the way of the world. It's a trap. When they grow up, they'll struggle. And I've had some who have said, I don't think my parents loved me. Because how come they let me do certain things? They look back and say, no. My parent was interested in themselves, being my friend, protecting themselves. They never loved me. Enough to correct me. Our children need to be strong. We are raising them for a, a dangerous world. So they need to be different. They need to be hard workers. Some of our children do not chores at all. At all. We are protecting them. From what? Why can't our children do chores? Why? There are people who are surprised, but for me, I learned these things and I've seen them in the homes of people who I honor and respect. There are children, you see some of our children won't even go to boarding school. So we make sure that they learn to do chores at home. They clean the house, they cook food, they do dishes, they wash their clothes, they, they set the table themselves, they clear it themselves. They should do, it. just because there's someone helping at home doesn't mean that the children should relax. They should wash their clothes, learn how to iron. These are skills. You don't know where they'll go in life and where they'll be and what skill they'll need. The only, they don't only need skills of swimming and chess and all these other nice things we are teaching them. They need life skills. Ability to be able to manage a home, whether you're a boy or a girl. Train up a child in the way they should go. 
And when they grow, they will not depart from it. Let me show you a scripture as I close this particular point. Hebrews 12, 11, it says, Now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. So don't be shocked when you feel bad and the child is sad because you're disciplining them, because you've said, no, you're not. Like for me, one of the things I don't allow, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not saying you should do this, I'm just telling you for me, I don't allow sleepovers. Because after much years of counseling as a pastor, Many weird things that happened to the children, which their parents don't know, happened at sleepovers. They picked up funny things, or weird things happened to them. Some of them are abused at sleepovers. Some of them start to learn about certain sexual things at sleepovers. You know, they are, they are only, there are a few people where I can allow that to happen. You have to be someone I literally consider my sister or brother. Like, yeah, and that's only about two or three people. So these things of we have a pyjama, I don't know, what do they call it, party, where they sleep at night. What am I doing sending a five-year-old to a pyjama party? Who is there? What will they find? Will they be able to understand what's going on? No, our children attend day parties. Day time is when you're supposed to have parties. Why should parties of children be in the night? Ah, they should be in bed sleeping. Anyway, I'm sorry to attack the pyjama party and sleepover thing. It just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. It does. So the children know. Like they asked and asked now, they, they even know they even tell it, no, we don't do sleepovers. Like it's not even a negotiation. Because it's over time and practice. You have to keep saying the thing until it sinks in that it will never happen. <laughs> Discipline does not seem joyful for the present but painful. Your child will make you feel like you're evil when you refuse to give them candy every day. They will make you feel like you're a bad person. You're so bad. You're making us suffer. The other parents are more fun. Stand your ground. You know what you're raising. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have fun. We have fun with our kids. Please, guys. We have lots of fun. <laughs> we even have family movie night once in a while. We eat together. We play. We talk. We, we share. But I'm talking about training up children. I, I've seen a thing that is scary. I'm telling you. The way we're raising children, many of us, it's scary, the kind of adults we will have. He says, nevertheless, it's painful now. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So do you know what trains children? Discipline. 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 Discipline is a form of love. Discipline is a form of love. Discipline is a form of love. You saw it in the other verse. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who disciplines, who loves him, disciplines him promptly. Proverbs 13, 24. I've read this for my children and I'm going to discipline them quickly. Say, I'm loving you. Because one day you will be an adult and you'll throw this thing and you will lose opportunities. No banging doors ever. Especially when you're angry. When you're very upset, you must close the door gently and you must speak in a good tone of voice and you must change your face. That's called self-control, where you don't have to show everything you feel all the time. You know those adults you meet who, they are sulking now, five, 20 minutes later, they are now happy, the mood has changed. Can't you, you can actually make your face normal even when you're feeling a thing inside. You don't have to always show what you're feeling. I think I've finished that point, that point. That trap must be dealt with, that trap of tra raising, raising our children according to the pattern of the world. It's a trap. Eventually, it needs to pain. Eh, that was, that was hot. I've, I'm, I'm even feeling it here, over here. Over here, it's hot. <laughs> I don't even think I'm going to touch the second trap. <laughs> but let me try. The other one is the trap of ignoring financial principles. In your early years, ignoring financial principles. I've realized that many of us, we live for now. You live for now, for today, for what's now, 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 now. And here are some of the principles that we ignore. That there are principles that govern financial increase. Simple, if you don't follow them, they don't follow you. If you follow them, they also follow you and you grow financially. And I've seen it as one who ignored these principles and suffered. And then I repented and started to see progress. Principle number one, hard work, hard work. Hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work. My generation, 
hard work, hard work and financial increase are related. The people you admire have heard about a new principle. Again, I might be under, under fire right now, but let me try. I prefer to be honest because sometimes I like to say the things that people will fear to tell you. Because who will tell you? There's this new concept, I don't really understand it, called the soft life. You know where everything is soft. You don't want any difficulty in life. And a soft life, baby girl, young man, you're in trouble. If you pursue a soft life in your early years, you will have a hard life in your later years. That's a guarantee. Unless you have an inheritance, which again you will squander and your children won't have one. The people you admire who have what you think is a soft life, it came out of sweat, hard work, discipline, grit, determination, pushing themselves beyond limits. That's why they have the things you admire. But you, you want to just find, you know, you know, a man who likes me and, you know, he takes care of me, he pays all the bills and um, builds me a big house. I just want to have babies. And even those babies, I don't want labor, okay? I just want a soft life and I don't want my body to change. So if babies are going to make my body change, you know, uh, then no, I, I won't be going for that. And then I just, you know, I want to sleep early every day, you know, wake up late. I just, you know, self-care and self-love, you're going to be broke. Don't believe what you see on Instagram. People show you pictures of when they're at parties, traveling. Where do you think they're getting the money? They will not tell you what they're doing to have what they have. Don't be deceived. Hard work is a principle when it comes to financial increase. The Bible says, unless you have something, you're wiser than God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, 22, In all labor, there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. If you're the kind who just wants to sit back and relax and talk, you're going to be broke talking. Yes. In all labor, as long as you put your hands to labor, there will be a profit. If you become idle, you'll be disorderly and broke. You need to work hard. We need to work hard as a generation. This idea of just not wanting anything difficult. The road to life is difficult. But the difficulty is not bad. Like when I'm working, Yes, it's hard. It, it, it requires me to exert myself, but there's a joy that comes from hard work. That even when you go to bed tired, like yesterday was Sunday, and I, and I was in services, I was at church from 5.30 a.m. up to about 8, p, 8 or 7 p.m., came home and hosted other people up to about 9 p.m. or so, or 10 p.m. And you know what? I went to bed tired, but I was happy. Labor. In labor, there is profit. Right now, as I'm teaching you, I'm laboring. There is profit in your labor. Forget this idea and this lie that you're supposed to somehow get wealthy by accident. You must work hard. If you have a job, do it well. Stop being the one who is at the job, or you're doing a very bad job at the job that they have, and then you're praying and saying they are persecuting you. No one, you are the persecutor of yourself. You go to work late, you do a bad job. During working hours, you're playing, I don't know, lunch hour. Uh, okay, lunch hour is lunch time. But you know what I mean? Like, instead of working, you're cheating the work. You're using their resources to do your own stuff. You're on social media and you're praying for promotion. It won't come. God is not unjust. He can't be mocked. He blesses the work of your hands. It's all over the scriptures. The Lord will bless the work of your hands. The Lord will bless your fields. The Lord will bless your livestock. In other words, you have things that you're working at and he's blessing them. The blessing of God needs to rest somewhere. What are you doing? Some of you have only one job, especially Africans. You only go to work 8 to 5. What about from 5 p.m. till about 9 p.m.? What are you doing? There's stuff you can do. What about at lunchtime when I had a job at lunch, I would go downtown in Kampala, buy things for reselling, make it back to work by 2 p.m. I didn't eat lunch. Lunchtime I was working as either buying things or I was going to different offices to take for customers the items they needed me to deliver. I wasn't very hard working, but I was trying. I was also always trying my hand at something else to make extra money. In all labor, there is profit. Yes, I didn't have the, I was very bad at managing it, but I was making it. Because now if you only make it also, hard work alone is not enough. The principles work together. The first principle is you must work. Stop this idea. Why aren't you working? I'm waiting on God. What does that mean? Get working. Go cook something and sell it. Go buy something and resell it. Go volunteer somewhere. Get off your behind and get working. The lazy church must go. We can't be known forever as lazy people, Christians. We don't even try to get a job but you say you're a Christian. They fear you because they know we are lazy, we are indisciplined, we are not excellent. We must change the story. Because let me tell you, financial increase begins with the diligence of hard work. 
it is what it is. In all labor there is profit. Proverbs 12, 27 says, The lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting, but diligence is man's precious possession. Diligence is precious. Diligence is hard work, it's determination, it's consistency. Show up on time. Do your job well. Have a great attitude. Give more than you're asked to give at work and you'll be promoted. And God will trust you with more and more and more. Be faithful to that's another man's. The other lie in there of, of financial principles is the principle of tithe. Many believers are not tithers. That's why many believers are broke. Because tithe is entering into covenant with God financially. You enter that covenant with God because he's the one who provides the 100% and he said that the 10th belongs to me. He has declared it. He has not asked you. He has actually told you it's mine. Return it. Because tithe is the system that rebukes the devourer. There's a curse on the earth. It's working whether you believe it or not. Just go and check outside your house. If you don't plant things, what grows are weeds. Nice things don't grow by accident. You don't find nice grass planted itself. But weeds, oh, they grow. And they are healthy. But you, you'll find that your plants are dying. The ones you planted, the weeds are growing. Because there's a curse on the earth. And you destroy that curse that is supposed to reduce you, that is supposed to make you toil by becoming a partner with God through tithe. You activate the blessing that's already yours in Christ Jesus. Become a tither. That one, let's not discuss it. Don't be the one who refuses. Like, how can you, your eyes are on the 10%. Your eyes, your eyes are on 10. You have 10 oranges, but you want the one that belongs to God. It's the one you want to eat. You have nine, they are yours. 10% is basically 10%. Give it to God and watch abundance come. He will open, he says, test me in this. See if I will not open the windows of heaven. And the tithe goes to your local church, not to the poor. The poor, you give them from your 90%. Because the house of God is the church. <laughs> then the principles of saving. That one I was bad. I was good at tithe and a little bit of hard work. Saving. I mean, I knew that money will come somehow. It will grow somehow. Do you know how it grows? By putting away some, at least a percentage. For us in worship harvest, we've learned from Apostle Moses and from the scriptures that you set aside at least 20% of all your income. All. If you do that consistently, within five years, you'll have changed completely your status. Three years, actually, maximum. Your status financially will be different. You put it aside for investment. You put it aside for investment. Don't eat everything you get because wealth is about what's left after you've eaten. Because when you go distribute, you don't get, you don't get wealthy by spending. Wow. And then, of course, investing and saving and investing. And lastly, generosity. This is the thing. It's not difficult to be wealthy. Work hard, give your tithe, save a percentage, be generous, and live within your means. Don't try to prove that you're wealthy when you're not. Pretending to be rich doesn't make you rich. Stop buying things you don't need, going to parties you can't afford. Prete you know, it's just poverty working in you and wanting to keep you there. It's a trap you shouldn't fall into. Ignoring financial principles and hoping that you'll be wealthy. Wow! That one I told you would be short. Because one day I'm planning to get into it in depth, principle by principle. But Apostle Moses has written an incredible book called Straightforward Financial Growth. It's on Kindle. It's also sold in, in bookshops in Uganda. It's a bestseller here in Uganda, at least, and in Africa, most of Africa. Get it. It's so simple. If you practice the five principles he gives you, proven, I've proved them. Our friends have proved them. People in worship service have proved them. You will succeed. Hard work, tithe saving and investing, generosity, and just living within your means. And then watch God increase you. And of course, changing your financial blueprint by reading. I'm saying practical things. You know, some of you want me to just get into very mysterious things. But I want us to get practical about this. Traps you shouldn't fall into. I know today's traps were sensitive, but I hope you've received them. The question is, what is Jesus saying to you, and what are you going to do about it? All these things I've taught, if you do nothing, nothing changes. But if you do something, something changes and you'll have a testimony. And that's what I want to hear. God is loving us. God is having mercy on us. Go change something. Go do something differently so that you can get different results. <laughs> you know, my heart, I love you. I really do. I really love God's people. I want us to succeed. I want us to show forth the glory of God. I want to pass on every little thing I've learned. I'm not where I should be by far. But I've seen some, some little progress, and that little excites me, and I want you to join me on it as we go. 
So what is Jesus saying to you about the things you've had so far and what are you going to do? Do something and do it immediately. Don't delay. Don't overthink it. Make some changes. Some of you need to start saving. Some of you need to start working hard. Some of you need to start tithing. Wow. <laughs> and then others, you need to be generous. You're too stingy because you see, generosity, let me read for you a scripture on generosity. I actually didn't read for you. Proverbs 11, 24 to 25. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Like imagine you, you don't give, but you're poor. The generous soul will be made rich. The generous soul will be made rich. The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will also be watered himself. The generous soul will be made rich. Stop holding on to all your money. Give away some. Be generous. Be generous. Be generous. If you practice those principles, you will see increase in your finances if you're consistent. Now you're watching me and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you right now. Just pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. Take my life and do something with it. Forgive me my sins and give me a life of glory. Today, I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. If you prayed that prayer, I'd like you to please send me a message. Please send me a message on the number I'm going to read out. 775 642 0775642449. Let us know that you've received Jesus. Tell me, let me know that you received Christ today on Faith Boosters. And of course, send me some testimonies. BeatriceBiamanzi at gmail.com. BeatriceBiamanzi at gmail.com. Tell me what the Lord has done in your life as a result of this teaching. And I want to know and celebrate with you. God bless you. Go raise your children in the way of the Lord. Go respect financial disciplines and you'll come back with a testimony because the, the wisdom of God is, 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 not, is without question. It doesn't repent. It is the same in every generation and in every nation. I look forward to seeing you succeeding in those areas of your life and to seeing God working in you. You are loved. You are blessed. See you next time. Bye.